Okay, so um, before I proceed, I just want to disclose that my research has been funded by private foundations and an IMH. One thing that's not there that I have to disclose that I'm a contracted trainer with behavioral tech. And as Seth mentioned, I started this work at Yale, and uh, Seth was the one who started training me in DBT, you're my sensei. And uh, it has been amazing, amazing. I remember when Seth just started to train me and I was trying to get to adherence in DBT, and I was you know, taping all of my sessions and he was looking through them, and the very first, actually the second uh, tape that he was able to see, uh, initially we had problems with sound, and I'm sitting down, he, he's telling me, you know what, I have one good news and one bad news. The good news is we have sound. The bad news, it's not DBT. <laughs> and you know what, now I agree with him because now I understand what is involved in becoming a DBT therapist. And I, of course, want to thank John Kaufman, Lawrence Cahill, Heather Douglas Palumbury, who are all here, and um, say thank you so much for all of your support. Without your help and enthusiasm for what I do, it will not be possible. So, of course, I also want to thank people at my new home at Well Cornell, where I'm under the wing of John Walkup. Uh, Donald Nathanson, my fabulous, fabulous, fabulous DBT therapist, and Amy Walkup, who is my therapist as well. She's doing treatment as usual on the other side. They're actually here in the audience. They told me if I ask them to wave, they're going to be mad at me, so please wave. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, I don't see you. Okay, so. Um, I also want to say thank you so much for the people at Green Chimneys. That's one of the studies that I'm doing with children in residential care, and they really did not know what they were getting themselves in when they invited me and say, okay, let's build it up. And uh, it was supposed to be a one-year study. We are year five now. And uh, I continue to tell them that we need to change, change, change. And they continue to tell me, yes, we do. Some things are happening, some things are not, but this is reality. Okay. I'm not attached to my slides. There are many more of them, more than I can actually cover in the talk. Most of them are for your information. And, uh, and of course, you can ask me whatever questions you'd like on anything that I'm missing, and I'll be available throughout the conference. And you can also email me. My email will be at the end of my slides. So we'll talk a little bit about what DBT is all about. I'll tell you how I was able to adapt it to children and some of the very preliminary look at what the children look like. Unfortunately, I don't have the results yet. I was working feverishly. One of my studies, active treatment is done, but we were not able to get the data, unfortunately, in today. If this conference was tomorrow, then yes, but not today. I know, I'm a tease. <laughs> Okay, so DBT overview. I can't go too much detail what DBT is all about. How many of you know what DBT is? Okay, fantastic, all right. Okay, so for those who don't, DBT is behavioral, DBT is cognitive, but this is so much more above and beyond that. And the main um, thing that I want you to remember is DBT is about balance, it's about balance between acceptance and change. And everything that we do in DBT in terms of skills training or in terms of the strategies and procedures that therapists are involving, uh, in, in, using, it's all either falling on the acceptance or the change continuum. Why acceptance is so important? Because if you don't accept that you have a problem, there is no change. One of the examples that I really like on this, Alcoholic Anonymous, the very first thing that a person does is what? They stand up and they say what? I am John Doe and I am an? Thank you. Why is that important? Person accepted. I'm here because I have a problem and therefore change is possible. People with substance use, alcohol abuse, what do they say? Usually if they don't, haven't accepted it yet. I have no problem. Are you kidding me? I can quit like this. Tomorrow I'm done, you know? Yeah, that's not an issue for me. So if there is no acceptance, what kind of change is possible? What are we doing with that? If you're just talking about acceptance, 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 uh, that's actually, okay. If you're just talking, if you're just accepting, 
if you're just there for the client, if you're just giving him validation and understanding, client is going to continue to come. However, at some point, client will still start experiencing high level of arousal and sense out of control and will feel invalidated because yes, you understand me, but you haven't helped me to resolve anything. It didn't help me to change. If you just focus on the change and tell him, you know, there are some of the issues, we need to resolve them, how we're going to do it. Again, high sense of arousal, feeling of con out of control, no collaboration, no learning, because what is, what's going on there is that the therapist is assuming that invalidating role of saying, you have a problem, you need to change. This is pretty much what they have been hearing since they were very little, right? Parents telling them, you have a problem, what's going on, you need to change. So acceptance is extremely, extremely important, not only from the therapist, clients are learning to accept themselves and accept their issues before they can proceed to changing them. What is our main target in DBT is of course emotion regulation. And what are the tasks? We want to decrease mood dependent behaviors. We want to help them reorient attention. And very importantly, organize their attention in the service of their goals. Now, um, what Anne Marietta was talking about in the previous presentation, she was talking about this um, invalidating environment. The mothers who are having difficulties raising their children and they may be doing things that is not helping the child to get, you know, uh, to get where they need to be and actually may prevent them to get to the well-being state that they want them to be. But in DBT, we have a biosocial theory in which we're saying, you know what? What it is, it's a combination between the biological predisposition to experience emotions on a different level, the sensitivity to the emotions, the vulnerability, and it's inborn. And then the child who is that sensitive and vulnerable is born into the environment that cannot help and support that. And it may not necessarily be an environment that is actually abusive or neglectful. No, yes, it can also happen. But what we're talking about here, it's a mismatch between what the child needs and what the parents can give. They can match the needs. And I don't see it as a theory. <laughs> For me, this is an everyday occurrence, what I see with my clients. And you know what? Some of the self-disclosure I have to say is that I have two kids. I have a 16-year-old daughter and I have a nine-year-old son. They're diametrically opposed, different. My, my daughter is like a duck in the waters. Everything just rolls down her feather. She's very resilient, if you want to call it that. My son, he's the sense to one. He is the one who would be like, I have a cut, I'm gonna die. And he actually thinks that, he actually feels it. It's not dramatic, he's not histrionic. It's, this, is, this is the level of fear and emotion that he has. And oh boy, am I happy that I was ready to actually know what to do with such a sensitive child. Because what is going on with children who are born sensitive is that they indeed have very easily activated arousal, meaning that little things for us, maybe not even noticeable, activate them and they react very, very strongly. Somebody didn't look at me right. Somebody didn't say hi. I dropped my toy and it cracked, whatever it may be. Another child will just go past it and not notice. This child will have a huge outburst and it will be very hard for that child to calm down. And sometimes we may not even understand what's going on. We may think that it comes out from nowhere. Well, you know what? Something is going on inside that child. Some thoughts, some feelings, some memories, something in the environment may cue it, boom, there is an outburst. So these children go from one to 100 pretty much in zero time a lot of the times. And it's very hard for them to stop. And then we couple it with what we call an invalidating environment. And again, don't be tripped by the name. All that means that 
again, not necessarily abuse and neglect, parents don't know what to do with these kids. They feel trapped because these kids don't come with instructions. None of them come, but these kids particularly need them. And what happens is the parent is saying, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just stop? Why are you reacting so much to such a small thing? Why can't you be just like your brother? Come on, just stop it, just snap out of it. And from all of that, what happens is chronic emotional dysregulation. One of the things that I wanna also say that, that, that the environment may bring is that a lot of the times when a child is having the outburst, the environment is not going to respond or respond in, not in, in a way that's supportive. And then child learns that, you know what, if I have a severe outburst that involves me saying I'm going to kill myself or I'm actually cutting, you know what, everybody comes running. So environment can actually also support extreme, um, uh, um, extreme expression of, of the emotion. So what we have out of that is an ability to understand and label their emotions because everybody's saying, why are you angry? You're not supposed to be angry. Why are you feeling angry? No, 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 don't feel angry. Well, child is like, okay, I guess I'm not feeling angry. So kid is really confused. Now, they can, of course, modulate the emotional reactions because maybe parents are themselves not sensitive and they have never learned how to deal with them, then how are they supposed to understand the child and teach the child how to modulate their emotions? They're clueless. Um, why DBT? There's a huge amount of empirical research right now on its effectiveness in tackling exactly what we need the emotion regulation. And it has been, you know, have so, such, such an incredible empirical support in the literature for adults. Alec Miller did it with adolescents with high degree of success. And uh, there are all kind of studies supporting what it's doing to the brain activity, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, however, what I want to say is that if you think about a sensitive child who has um, what's now in DSM-5 called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, we'll talk about this a little bit later. In my view, you know, I would not be surprised if research shows over time that children with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, some of them are on the trajectory to, be, to have borderline personality disorder later in life, just like children with conduct disorder, and some of them are on the trajectory to develop antisocial personality disorder. Because a lot of things that we see with children with severe sensitivity and vulnerability is what exhibited by patients with borderline personality disorder. Um, you know, a lot of kind of either or thinking, uh, suicidality, self-harm behaviors, extreme expressions of emotions, it's all there. So what did we do to adapt DBT for children? Again, you'll have a lot of slides there that I will not cover in detail there for your information, and uh, I will be very, very happy to answer your questions either today or over the email. Some of the things that were added to the DBT model, we needed to make sure that children can actually understand what emotions are. We needed to make sure that parents can understand what the emotions are, why, they, why, why we need it. We needed to understand how they start, how to, what to do with them, and um, how they're different from thoughts and behaviors. So we added didactic on emotions to the individual part. Um, some of the skills have been changed, simplified, condensed, and you'll see a little bit later that we even have different acronyms. Here's some of the handouts. Stop skill, this is something that has been uh, developed for DBT for children to help them um, stop the reactivity in the moment, the impulsive um, behaviors in response to the stress. Actually, Marsha Linehan really liked that skill and now it is also a part of DBT for adults. So what that is, uh, just to give you an example of how we do it with kids. STOP is an acronym. S stands for stop, freeze, don't move a muscle. If you indeed can do that, 70%, 80% of your problem is solved because you indeed were able to become aware that you're about to react, and if you react, it's not going to make it better, it may actually make it worse. You are willing 
to actually stop, meaning that you'll be willing to do something different about it. Then the rest of this is you take a step back, you detach them from the situation a little bit, you're breathing in and out to calm down. Then you're much more ready to observe what's going on inside and outside of you. You need the information. And then once you have this information, you're a little bit calmer, you detached, you didn't react, now you can proceed mindfully. You can ask your wise mind what to do, depending on your goals. So how do you do that? You train, you practice, you role play. A lot, every day, instructing parents, you have to do a lot of hypothetical situations in which the child will, may be reacting and you want to instruct him to freeze. And we give all kind of rewards at the end of it, even if it's hypothetical. So the more parents are able to role play hypothetical situations, the higher the probability, because it's a behavioral rehearsal, the child will actually be able to stop and freeze in the moment when they are to become dysregulated. It's very important. Practice, practice, practice is important for everybody. For children, triple the importance. Well, I'm not going to go again in depth what we did to adapt. As I said, we simplified them. Um, all four modules are there. Uh, mindfulness and personal effectiveness, emotional regulation, uh, distress tolerance, everything is there. These acronyms are a little bit different uh, and more child-oriented. Uh, some of the handouts on the skills. Opposite action. All right, the three-headed dragon of chain analysis. So chain analysis, uh, chain and solution analysis in DBT is something that is staple trying to figure out what is it that happened and what to do instead. It's quite a difficult thing to do with adults. They don't like doing it. And sometimes it's so toxic that therapists collude with the client not to do chain analysis. So therapists have to be really careful uh, to really understand the reinforcements that are going on, the negative and the positive there, so because their behaviors are also being reinforced by the client reactions. Well, anything that we do with kids, the easiest way to teach it's through games, right? So this is a game. And people are asking me, uh, how did you come up with a three-headed dragon? I said, well, it was easy for me. All dragons in Russia have three heads. <laughs> it's, it's a Russian dragon. Um, how to use it? All right, emotion wave. Everything starts with event. Emotions don't come about by themselves. Something has to trigger them. So emotion wave is event. Then, not feeling, interpretation of the event. Because that interpretation can, can, can make a difference in, in terms of how you feel about the event. Then the feeling that brings in all kind of sensations, urges to, to act, such as when you're angry, you want to do what? Yell, fight, scratch, bite, right? And this is the action urge. Now, you don't have to do it. You are not your emotion. You may actually say to yourself, you know what, this is what emotion is telling me to do. However, in that situation, that's not going to be effective for me to, move, to actually do it what it tells me to do. So then you have action, whether or not you're going with the emotion, depending on the situation, the action urge. And then, of course, the after effects, positive, negative consequences, more thoughts, behaviors, other people saying and doing things. And all of that can start all new wave. And that's very important to remember, because how long do you think one emotion lasts? One, one discrete emotion. Guess. Five seconds. All right, two minutes. All right, so one discrete emotion lasts about 40 seconds. When I tell it to Klein, they say, what are you talking about? I've been mad for three weeks now since that happened. <laughs> Telling me it's 40 seconds? I was like, yes, it's 40 seconds. Because what happened was you had one emotion, anger. And then you start ruminating. You start doing things that anger wants you to do. Fight, scream, you know, uh, you know send texts that are angry, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. And then that one discrete emotion turns into what? Many, 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 many of the same emotion. Here we have a mood. All right, so 
you know, all of these things are actually what I'm describing. I'm giving you a sample of what we talk with children when we're doing didactics on emotions. So we're using our wave paradigm in terms of emo how emotions comes up when we do the dragon game. All right, for example, event. A boy called me names. Thought, you know what? He hates me. And you know what happens? People who have such strong emotions, they take their thoughts and feelings and they take them and they, and they actually think of them as facts. That's why, you know, check your facts thing in DBT. Of course, feeling of anger, it's a fact, he hates me. Now, what's the urge to kick him? What did actually happen? I did kick him and uh, I got into detention. And then you say to the girl, hey, you know what? I totally understand why you would feel angry if somebody calls you name, names. I would feel angry too. We call it, thank you, validation. All right, very important, staple. We need to have validation. That's one of the acceptances um, strategies. Do you th did you like the outcome, the detention? Did you like to get into detention? No. All right, so what do you wanna do with that? Next time somebody calls your name, what are you gonna do? Do you wanna think of something different? Yeah. Then what we do, we interrupt the urge and the action by our stop skill. You have a feeling, you have an urge, freeze. Don't move a muscle. All right, what I'm gonna do here, and I am going to maybe go and tell a teacher after I stopped and freezed. That's one solution. Another solution, and then the after effect would be, you know, I'll get praised, I'll feel proud of myself. You know what, I'm the boss of myself. That's one of the uh, uh, goals that we have for these kids, to be the boss of themselves. And of course, they wanna be proud, they want everybody to be proud of them. Now, another solution, we always need a backup. Walk away, and what will happen is, again, feeling proud of myself. You know, situation did not, you know, got worse, maybe even got better. All right. So this is pretty much the chain analysis uh, in a very simplistic way, and you can go higher and higher, you know, with, with all those cards. And this is actually a, a game, you know, it's a huge poster, um, you know, with its magnet receptive materials. So, you know, the little cards we've placed on it, you know, we'll write all of this out uh, with the child. Um, and, and then, you know, we actually sometimes write it on the sheet of paper so the children can take it back and look at it next time they, they need to figure out what to do. Okay, so these are some of the things that we came up with in terms of uh, using the skills. Sometimes children would stop and freeze and then they kind of like, okay, how do I proceed mindfully? What do I do? They may kind of get stuck because they're still emotional. And this is something that we came up with was it's, it's, it's a skills wheel. What you do is, it's this actual skills wheels from some of my clients. You have a wheel and you, you know, the, your favorite skills you put there and you just, Flip the error and whatever it, ends, it, it lands on, you have to do it. Simple enough, and also introduces the game in it, and some fun. Okay, so diary card, absolutely. Children, I don't care, it's diary card, we need to have it. And of course, we're not expecting that the child is going to be able to do this without a parent. We actually are not expecting the child is going to be able to do any of this without a parent. I'll talk about this more. So parents are there to uh, help them, and what we're tracking is emotions, we're tracking suicidality, self-harm, we're tracking ineffective behaviors, such as aggression, destructive behaviors, we're tracking effective behaviors, absolutely, such as ignoring, walking you, or whatever it is, and then we're looking at which skills they were able to use throughout the week. Wow, parent training component. Well, you know what? DBT is not an individual therapy for a child. Absolutely not. It's a family therapy. The more I do it, the more I realize that it's a family therapy. Because otherwise, it's like doing couples therapy with seeing individually separately. You can't do that. You need the dyad there. Sometimes I do child se see a child separately for the individual. However, a lot of the time, especially if the child is, is, is like uh, seven, eight, nine, I do uh, absolutely, you know, most of the time have a parent in there because 
It's a problem in a relationship that we need to resolve. And the parent being there, that's, that's the child's world. That's where they're coming from. That's, that's the environment, you know, the validating or invalidating environment that can actually support the child or get the child in a position that they're going to be more and more dysregulated. And I keep telling my parents, you know what, there are, there's absolutely no way I'm going to see that child if you don't commit to doing it with him, full force. Four cardinal rules of parenting in my mind. Number one, they're very simple and very hard to do. Number one, model the behaviors you want. How you expect your child not to scream, kick, and fight? If something comes up, you're upset, you scream at your kid. Or you physically punish them. Absolutely can't. And then sometimes parents are telling me, well, yeah, but it's so hard to ignore them because I feel so upset when they do this and that. And I say, absolutely. It's very, very hard. Are you kidding me? I'm a parent. I know what it looks like. You think I don't want to throw my kids out of the balcony? Yeah, sometimes I do. <laughs> it's very, very hard. And on the other hand, listen, we're asking your seven-year-old to learn all of these skills so that he can be in control of his emotions. And you're telling me that you, a 45-year-old, cannot do it because it's hard? Please. You have to understand whatever behaviors you model, that's the behaviors the child is going to do. Parents come in a lot of the time with an expectation that child should be polite, should be respectful, should be following directions right away, blah, 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 blah. And they're shocked when I tell them, absolutely not. Child should not do any of that. None. You reinforce it, they do it. You don't, they don't do it. Simple as that. What are shoulds? Shoulds are imposition and reality. This is the picture that we draw of how we want things to be. And then we impose it on reality, it ain't matching, and then we continue to pose and impose it, ain't matching, and then we continue to make us, ourselves very, very upset. And what happens with that is that we turn pain into suffering. What is the difference? First thing that I want to say is sometimes parents, you know, coming in and saying, I can't do it, you know, this, this is very hard, you know, what this is is that we have a delusion, and it's truly a delusion, not my words, this is Marshall Linehan's words, that we cannot tolerate pain. Yes, we can. Pain is an integral, natural part of our lives. We need to have it, because if you're sitting at the beach sipping pina colada, you're not learning anything, right? It's very, very important to relax. However, there are no challenges that are presented to you that you need to overcome and solve. And if you do overcome and solve them, you progress to the next level of mastery, understanding, and learning. If you hide away, if you run from them, if you avoid, what happens is, you turn that pain into suffering. Suffering is pain plus not accepting of that pain because of that delusion that we can't tolerate it. Parent who is giving in to the child temper outburst in a store because they can't accept the pain of child screaming and, they, and everybody's looking at them and, and judging them and thinking what a bad parent you, know, you are. And they say, okay, just have it, stop it, just stop it. You know what, that, that parent was not able to tolerate that pain in the moment. Now they turn their pain into suffering because every time child wants that candy in the store, you bet he's gonna do it. And it's going to be very hard to extinguish. One of the things we teach, a lot of the things that we're teaching, it's very important for them to understand that they need to accept their child as the child is. There's nothing, there are no bad people or good people. We are all people, that's it. Parents always ask me how I'm able to tolerate their children in the session. Because they are bouncing off the walls, really. Well, I have several, several answers to that. The, the, the first one is that I have my hierarchy of what I wanna do. You know, me having that child sit in the chair quietly and that's my whole time spent on getting him in that chair, you know, that's not worth it. 
I want him to learn, I want him to listen. If he's bouncing off the wall, but he's answering my questions and I know that he's processing and understanding, that's it, I don't care. Number one. Number two, I accept. I accept and I don't judge. It's a child, you know? He's doing it, you know, because there's some kind of function to that behavior. Very important. What is the function of behavior? If you can accept child for what they are, not judge them, because a lot of the times parents are sitting there and judging the child and judging themselves. Oh my gosh, she's gonna think I'm a horrible parent. Oh my gosh, she's gonna think my child is so you know, bad behaved. And, and they get discombobulated with that. And they can tolerate it. And they look at me, I'm like, so relaxed. And he's like making grounds on my head and throwing things and whatever. I'm like, whatever, you know, it is what it is. But I'm sitting there, I'm not just staring at the wall, I am figuring out why is this child doing this? And how can I help this child do differently? If you have that goal, as opposed to continuing to judge and like be tense about this, two different ways of handling the situation. Okay, so function of the behavior is extremely important. Very good example. One of my mother's five kids, single parent. One of her daughters is very aggressive to the siblings. She is kicking, screaming, taking their toys, whatever it is. What the mother is doing, whenever she's aggressive for, this, you know, for the safety of the other kids, she grabs that child, drags her to a different room, restrains her, and starts telling her to calm down. Well, what's the function of the behavior? What do you think? Exactly. Can you imagine five kids? This mom doesn't have time for all of them, you know, to, to the degree that they may want. So this kid, you know, was actually using that behavior to get that hug, to get that mom to themselves. So hypothesis, you know what? Maybe that's the function of the behavior. Let's test it. You're going to get, the, chi the child's going to get exactly the same thing by, your, by yourself, in the room, hugging, talking, whatever it is. For prosocial behaviors, such as sharing, being nice to, their, to the siblings, you know, talking nicely, whatever it is. You know what? Solved. I could have thrown all kind of skills to that child. Walk away when you are, you know, um, provoked by your sibling, you know, when they take your toy, breathe, whatever it is. I could have reinforced every time she would go away. And it's not gonna be consistent. It would not stay. It would not be maintained or be very useful, maybe sometimes, because the function is not solved. You figure out the function, you figure out how to solve it in a different way, you're done. Um, a lot of what we're doing, we're talking about side effects of punishments. We're talking about the dialectic of parenting. I'm not going to go into any of that. You got a taste of this here and there. Um, what I want to make sure that, that you understand that what we do, a lot of it is not necessarily teaching them what to do with the behavior, the change. A lot of our work is on helping the parent accept, accept the child and accept themselves. And when we talk about the function of the behavior so that the parents, will, instead of getting discombobulated about their child being bad, they would need be able to actually figure out what the function of the behavior is and how to, how to help that kid get that function. And um, just, just the other day, oh my God, that's a great story. Just the other day, I have this nine-year-old who is sitting there and he thinks that his mother hates him. And you know what, his mom doesn't hate him, but that's exactly what she exhibits with the way she talks to him, with the way she screams at him, with the way she's comparing him to siblings and so forth, so on. And this nine-year-old is sitting there and you know, I'm, I'm talking to him, I'm saying, you know what, you must be feeling very sad thinking that your mom hates me. And this nine-year-old looks at me and he's saying, I'm not sad, I'm ashamed. <gasps> oh, nine-year-old who's ashamed of himself on that level and he can actually understand and verbalize it. Ashamed that he's not good enough because he's continually getting that message. I'm being screamed at. I'm being told what I'm doing is wrong, what I'm feeling is wrong, what I'm thinking is wrong. Everybody else around me are better. I cannot control myself. What are they supposed to think about themselves? Absolutely that. Deep, deep shame. And you know what comes from deep shame? One of the functions of the behavior that we're seeing? Child who is miserable, 
would want to make the parent miserable. One of the functions. When you understand that, you first need to start repairing the relationship. You can't teach skills and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. You have to step back and say, OK, I need to repair the relationship in a way that's going to actually be helpful in and support all of the, what we're going to be doing on top of it. We want the child to actually want to be reinforced by the parent, we want the child to be around the parent, we want the child to look up to the parent and want to please them as opposed to make them miserable. If we have that, excellent. We can really capitalize on that. Um, that's why I continue to tell the parents the cardinal rules of parenting. Model all the behaviors you want, number one. Number two, if you don't like the behavior, how, whatever it is, name calling, swearing, whatever it is, as soon as it's not uh, safe, it's, it's, it's not a, as soon as it does not have any problems with safety to the child or somebody else or property, ignore, ignore, ignore. Very hard to do. Well, you know what? You have all those skills. You know, use your skills. Ignore. You like the behavior, reinforce it. <laughs> Parents don't do it, you know. A lot of the times their attention is actually dragged to the negative behavior because this is very, very understandable. Our emotion mind, somebody is screaming, you we turn to that and we actually want to do something about it. You know, how many times do you have you seen children sitting on the floor playing together nicely, parent coming in and saying, Oh my God, guys, I'm so happy you're playing so nicely together. Great job. I'm gonna get you cookies and milk and whatever. No. Kids are quiet. Okay, I'm going to go. Have some coffee. <laughs> so, as soon as kids stop squabbling, what happens? What's going on here? Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Ugh, so much attention paid. What do you want? One of the functions of the behavior, kids got reinforced by attention, by do, for doing what they're doing. They're not manipulative. They're not pushing buttons. Their behavior got reinforced. That's, that's, that's how they know how to get what they want. They have a temper tantrum. Parent can take it, because apparently we cannot tolerate pain, right? And then they give them whatever the child wants. Boom. Child learned. All right, that's what I need to do next time. So what does the parent want? OK. So we have model the behavior you want, reinforce what you like, every little thing, because reinforcement doesn't happen because of the shoots. Why should I be reinforcing my child for being polite? He should be that. Or being respectful, he should be that. Or for following directions, he should do that, right? No, he should do nothing. And the fourth one is play with your kids. Have fun with them. If you have a child who actually enjoys your company, how much more reinforcing your praise is going to be? How much actually he'll be looking up to you and want to spend time with you and would want to make you feel proud and happy instead of miserable? So you think I want to come home after a whole day of clients bouncing off the wall and play nerve gun with my nine-year-old? Running around the house, shooting? No. Or watch anime with my daughter on YouTube? Oh my God, spare me. <laughs> it's what I do because that's what they like. And I want to share in that. And they're, and they're waiting for me to come home because I'm the one who's actually taking their interests seriously. And you know what? I have very, very, very minimal problems with my kids. My daughter only had three temper outbursts in her entire life. She was three. She knew how to execute them perfectly. Um, I am not a germaphobe. However, I actually don't like when my three-year-old is on the floor in a shopping mall doing this. <laughs> <sighs> and I have to stand, not look. The three monkeys can look, can hear, can talk. Perfect image of ignoring. Stand there and think, oh my god, what kind of bubonic plague she's going to bring. <laughs> And I have to take her to the emergency room right now after this. So, but I was able to tolerate that. And then, boom, after three times trying, she learned, eh, eh, mom ain't budging. So that's what we're hopefully going to instill in our parents. But to do any of that, they need to first accept and let go. And see their children for what they are. 
human beings with behaviors that are learned. And the learning is there. And we need to help them to learn something different to get to their goals. All right, I'm not going to go through the slides. How much more time do I have? Uh, you are uh, just over 10 minutes. To go? About, about 13 minutes. Oh my gosh. All right, current research on DBT. This is my wonderful outpatient research team. Donald Nathanson, wave. How oh, cool. Uh, Amy, Caitlin, and me over there. Oh, the, the dragon, remember? We talked about the dragon? All right. So this research is with children with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Very neat, clear-cut study, only kids with DMDD. Uh, what's DMDD? Multiple, at least three behavioral outbursts that are not in proportion to the situation. He didn't look at me right. I have a temper outburst for an hour, or my client yesterday, she got a portion of ice cream that was smaller than she wanted. She had an outburst, I think, for five or six hours with kicking the car, kicking the mom, running into the streets, you know, the whole gamut of things. Um, and in between of the, of the outbursts, uh, the child exhibits irritable, angry mood. So I just want to make sure that we understand these are not kind of kids. It's a completely different breed of kids. They're sensitive kids. They are not the ones who are aggressive and they're, and they're proactive. They're not the predatory type. They're not conduct disorder. They are reactive type. They are reactive type because emotions feel different to them. We may not be able to appreciate what emotions feel to them because if what we experience emotion from one maybe to five, they go straight to 10. It's so overwhelming, it's almost toxic. They can't contain it, it spills out. Okay, so this study, 44 kids. Oh my God, ask Donald how we got there. It's all him, all him, all him. Thank you so much. And um, 22 in each condition, it's DBT for children versus treatment as usual, whatever is usually right now delivered at uh, Cornell. And my studies, we're just starting to do DBT with kids. So the studies that I'm doing are kind of stage one feasibility, uh, um, and maybe some preliminary efficacy. But what we want to see is can we do it with pre-adolescent kids? Can they understand it? Can they use it? Can their parents do it? Can we do it in the format that we're doing it? Because it's a little bit different from the usual. The format is, uh, so this is, this is the inclusion criteria. And the format is in a way that we need to do sessions with the child and the parent in it. So, we can't have child coming in by themselves. We absolutely need to have a parent component in it because the, the parent needs to learn, number one, everything that I said about you know, their, their own reactions to the kid and how to modify it. They also need to learn what the skills are so that they can model them themselves. They can prompt the use of skills from the child. They can coach the child in the use of skills. So they have to be there 100%. And the way we did it is that everything that we're teaching didactically to the child, be that skills, be that didactic of emotions, parents are absolutely have to be there. Uh, also, parents receiving their separate tra uh, training on, in behavior modification techniques and validation techniques and, di and didactics on what is the dialectics on parenting, and uh, they're receiving skills training together. So session in the outpatient looks like well, again, you know, it's a, a function of a form in DBT. Nothing is set in stone. 30 minutes with the child, 20 minutes with the parent, 40 minutes with skills. And then you mix and match whatever you need to do. Okay, the other challenge was skills training. The skills training in DBT for adults and um, adolescents is groups. You know what? Put in a group seven-year-old with a 13-year-old, what are you gonna get? And parents on top of it, nobody's getting anything, right? You really need to be very careful because the developmental levels, the cognitive levels are so different. You really have to understand your population and really uh, have to do it on the individual basis. That's why the, the skills training is in there, um, you know, within the individual therapy. Um, well, this child is not just behaving that way at home, 
Schools are also a big part of this. Remember, DMDD is at least two settings, so we always have something else going on outside the house. And you know, we always have to figure out how to approach the schools and do um, uh, programs in the school settings. And that's actually quite challenging on some levels. And on some levels, it's very rewarding because you can see how the teachers are starting to understand the concept that we're teaching. And some of the teachers are telling me, you know what? I use this on all the kids now. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for teaching me this. OK, so DBT for kids is a 26 sessions. But again, sessions, with it's topics. You can deliver them so far in a 32-week format, whichever way you want it. Treatment as usual is pretty much exactly the same, 26 sessions, but they can go all the way to 32 weeks. And then we have three months follow-up uh, with some booster sessions in between one to booster sessions per, per month. And uh, this is uh, clinical side, this is Whale Cornell and your Presbyterian. Okay, so what do our kids look like? We have a pretty good split between you know, males and females. Most of them Caucasian. High SES. Um, lots of parents are reporting a psychopathology themselves. Uh, high education, no high level of education in the family, and a third of them actually got parenting training, uh, which I don't know what kind of parenting training it was because most of them coming in and telling me, yeah, 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 I'm doing point chart, but it ain't working because they ain't doing it right. Um, this is what they are look like in terms of diagnoses. We have a lot of ADHD, actually lower than I would, ex ooh, than I would be expecting, but uh, pretty much there, anxiety disorders. Interesting, you see, we, in our samples, you know, as opposed to what literature shows, we did not have anybody with diagnosed depressive disorder outside of the DMDD. And which is absolutely understandable, none of them are actually also diagnosed with conduct disorder, which actually can, as per the diagnostic manual, you can have with this comorbidity. But in my mind, there were like two things on the opposite extremes, you know, reactive and proactive aggression. And you know, a lot of them had multiple diagnoses, actually half of them. Now, when I talk to program officers in grant, um, you know, NIH, whatever it is, they keep asking me, so why do you need to do DBT? This is so big and it's like, you know, so complicated. Do these kids actually need it? Are you kidding me? You know, so, and I say, seven year old, more than 50% suicidality and self harm. Seven year old, eight year old, nine year old. You know where they're going with that trajectory? Yeah. We need this. All right. What was interesting when we're starting assessing those kids, this is something that we haven't been starting to do at the very beginning of the study, but we added that measure because parents were telling us our child has sensory processing issues with sounds, taste, touch, either them or their siblings. And when we actually incorporated into, into, into the assessment, we saw that, yeah, you know, T-scores, this is kind of like a 70 and above is a severe problem, and some problems, you know, up to 70. So a lot of them are either some problems in sensory processing or definite dysfunction in sensory processing, meaning that there's something in the brain, the sensitivity is spread out. It's physical sensitivity and emotional sensitivity. It's very, very interesting. I was very excited about that. Um, Yep, they all have definitely serious, you know, uh, you know, issues with functioning on the sea gas. Um, a lot of them had previous outpatient therapy. Some had hospitalizations, and almost half of them had special services at school, like one-on-one -on -one people who are following them around, or special schools, or whatever it is, because it's very, very hard to maintain them in the community. Now, they are on medication. Yep, and a lot of them. Uh, are actually um, on stimulants, which is understandable, you know, ADHD. And uh, here's the breakdown. So some of them are actually on more than one or two meds. Okay, DBTC for children in residential care. So this is my crew in Green Chimneys Residential Care. Fantastic, fabulous therapist. I love working with them. They were so hungry because they were feeling overwhelmed, didn't know what to do with these kids, you imagine? And they really jumped in with both feet and ate it up. So, 
Uh, there we have uh, 47 cases, 27 in DBT and 20 in uh, treatment as usual. And our inclusion, this is a much messier study. Remember that one, DMDD, very clear cut. This is pretty much everybody's there, if, unless they have mental retardation. And um, well, look at that. We have very low threshold, what we call mental retardation. So a lot of them have cognitive problems. Uh, unless they have PDD or psychosis or bipolar, they're in. So we have a lot of variability there. So I, I don't know what that data is gonna look like. And again, our main issue was to figure out, can we do it? Can we build a program like that in residential care for children? Will, will they be coming? Will they be accepting? And then the second question is, you know, what the benefits are. Okay, so it's pretty much very similar, 26 individuals, uh, 26 uh, skills training session. Now, remember DBT function over form? Here we can actually do group trainings and skills because these children are by units, by age. So we have lots of seven, eight-year-olds in one unit and you know, so forth. So we can actually do, it's, it's programmatically possible and feasible to do group you know, skills training with kids. Um, now, when I moved into that, doing the study in residential care at Green Chimneys, I moved in a very opportune time because at that point they were constructing new dorms. And I was actually able to randomize kids, DBT dorm, TU dorm, separate staff, separate therapists, fantastic, because otherwise what are you gonna do? put a dot on the child's head and said, you treat that one with the dot this way and without the dot the other way, not possible. So very rare opportunity and very, very grateful to Green Chimneys for inviting me and actually allowing me to do this. Now, um, you know, this is a treatment as usual that they're doing now. Some of the challenges there is that they're there for two or more years. You know, they continue to, you know, have the same DBT group all over and over again and some of them don't need it anymore, so what do you do? Well, we actually do a uh, levels of groups. So newcomers, at least two, we need to have at least two rounds of DBT, so it's a full year of DBT. And then uh, if they actually did that, they either go to pre-graduate or graduate, pre-graduate, children completed all of that two rounds of DBT skills training. However, they're still continuing to struggle to implement it. Then we're doing pre-graduate when it's DBT heavy with an application, actual application to the dorm in their lives. And then the graduate group, it's talking about discharge and talking about you know, real life, DBT in real life. What would they need to do? How would they need to use those skills outside of the program? The other one was reinforcement. Oh, just like with parents, punishment, something that's heavily done, reinforcement that's not that much done. So there was no programmatic ways of reinforcing that was systematic. The kids, so um, we implemented stamping charts. Uh, kids could be getting all kinds of rewards for doing the skills, for doing effective behaviors, and they love it. And um, also acknowledgement of some of the children who are doing better in DBT program, and we, we had a rising star which would be a child who did so much significantly better than, you know, from before. Or Shining Star, this is the child who just excels in DBT. And we also have graduate group shout out, you know, those are the, our graduates who actually help with running DBT groups um, in the first level. And kids love when other kids come in and teach and actually talk about their experiences. I had one kid who really did not want to engage really had difficulty engaging, he was saying, DBT sucks, don't even say DBT skills, I'm not talking about the DBT. And then over time, when he was about to uh, get discharged, you know, this child, is, that's one of my therapists is saying, this child is sitting in a group, and somebody else complaining that DBT sucks, and he's like, DBT is the best thing in the world, everybody have to learn DBT, you kidding me? So, you know, you can actually get a shift, that was like poster child for DBT, you know, I wish I could like have his photo saying DBT is okay. Okay, so also, um, milieu communication, there was a big disconnect between milieu, this is the staff on the floor, and therapists and all of that, and we needed to get them together and, and discussing and making sure that they all on the same page, what is it that we're doing. Milieu was also not trained. It, I, this, this is something that I continue to struggle with and understand it's real life and I'm having, I'm accepting it, but I'm having a hard time understanding how we can actually solve that effectively and very fast. In my mind, if you're not trained in behavioral modification technique, you cannot even look at a child in a professional capacity. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Right? 
Oh, none of them are. They have no idea what's reinforcement and punishment, extinction, or whatever else is. They don't know any of that. How come? You're doing it in fresh capacity, you don't know? Those are your tools of the trade. Kidding me? All right, so we had to train everybody. Everybody got trained. And actually, I also had to train adjunctive stuff, nursing, interventionists, because what happens a lot is child is cutting, they go to nursing, and nurses are like, oh, you poor thing, what happened to you? Oh, got a boo-boo, okay, go lay down, watch TV, and I'm gonna bring you dinner. You know what, I'll be cutting all the time. <laughs> okay, so this is how our sample looks like. Uh, we only had boys because there were not a lot of uh, girls to randomize. And uh, okay, so here we have a bit of a different number. So we have a lot of things going on. You can understand those are the kids that cannot be managed at home. We have ADHD, disruptive behavior, a huge, huge amount of numbers. A lot of them more have like more than 60%, three or more diagnoses. And the you know, full scale IQ, you know, not too high. A lot of them have suicidal ideation and behavior. Huge amount of them, psychiatric hospitalization. A lot of them had been hospitalized four more times. Uh, they started as young as seven, and uh, you know, pretty much most of them had previous outpatient and starting as young as five. Okay, a lot of them are on all kind of medications, and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Francesca. We have uh, some questions that have come in. We may have time for more than this. Uh, the question is, how do you help kids differentiate what are real dangers from their emotional reactivity, their own emotional reactivity? When How you do children this differentiate or How adults? How do you help them tell the difference between whether they're reacting to a real danger versus they're having an emotional reactivity to something that may not be a real danger when you use that stop skill that you talked about? Yes, very good question. So check the facts. Is this something that's real? Is the lion charging at you is about to eat you? You have fear? Yeah, don't stop and freeze and think, okay, what am I going to do this right now? No, 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 run. However, if there's a lion that's in a cage and you still have phobia, you know, you have, have still fear, now your fear is not justified, you have to stay there and, and expose, right? So you teach them to differentiate, uh, especially with children, you need to have, be very concrete. And does that influence the fight or flight response? Does, does what, this, does this what decrease influence? When, you, when you teach them to freeze? Does that influence their fight or flight response? This is a question. Okay, you. so freeze itself, I don't think it influences the, the, it influences the reactivity, right? So they stop themselves from re reacting. Fight and flight response, you know, as far as I understand, it's sympathetic nervous system. We have a lot of skills that are, to, are, are getting, um, you know, getting the parasympathetic nervous system to, to get activated. What is this? You know, sympathetic is our fight and flight, Parasympathetic is the one in which you actually you know, rest and digest. There are lots of skills that we're teaching them that will activate parasympathetic nervous system, meaning that their arousal will calm down and they'll be able to think straighter and be able to arrive at a solution as opposed to when they're discombobulated. So I'm not sure if I answered that one. Thank you, no, I, I think that's helpful. We have a couple of questions related to motivation and, and uh, getting kids to commit. Uh, without eliciting defensiveness or um, th them being resistant. Dealing with resistance. Oh, oh, great, great, great. Okay, so Marsha Linehan um, originally was telling everybody that everybody has to do, you know, be adult, adolescents, whatever it is, everybody has to do uh, the skills that she's doing, that she presented in the way that she's doing them. The teaching notes can be different, and then she turned on and said, Francesca, that doesn't apply to you because she understands as we're talking with kids, we're talking about kids here. And again, I forgot about the question. Uh, it was about dealing with resistance or oh, defensiveness oh. that might arise when you introduce problems and try to get motivation. So yeah. dealing with resistance or defensiveness. I don't know why I got Marsha Linehan in there. Okay, so, um, and, uh, okay, I lost my train of thought. Resistance and motivation. Oh, and the other thing that she told me that everybody has to commit in DBT except for what I do because some kids coming in that, you know, kicking and screaming that want to be there, rarely, but they do, we don't elicit commitment from kids. If we see that the child is not going to make, we just, we just forget about it. We need the commitment from the parent. Okay, uh, uh, how young an age do you suggest ignoring the behavior, thinking of babies, infants, um, as long as it's not a safety issue? Uh, at how, long, at, at, at how young would you ignore as to not reinforce? Oh, I ignore my all the time. 
from very, very, as, as, soon, as, as soon as they were able to focus on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> which probably will be different from what Arietta would, would actually suggest. But really, with my kids, especially with my son, you know, something is going on, he's discombobulated, he's running, mommy! He's like, he knows the drill. <sighs> Okay, mommy, I'm calm. Great job coming down. Okay, what happened? All right, now he's able to understand and connect. You know, I need to be calm. My mom is not giving, going to give me attention if I'm upset. So um, as early as, as I, I don't know, uh, one and a half, I guess. Okay. Yeah? Can you, can you please speak Again, to just come, no, no research support. <laughs> can you uh, uh, please uh, explain the difference between acceptance versus overindulgence when responding to temper tantrums? Oh, uh, acceptance does not mean no change. Acceptance means that I'm accepting that my child is having a tantrum, tantrum, temper tantrum. However, I'm in no way going to give it attention. That's the change. So there is absolutely no indulgence in terms of the temper tantrum. There is a flexibility in built in. If child is crying because, you know, somebody didn't look at him right, you know, that's one thing, you ignore that. If child fell and scraped his knee and crying, yes, absolutely, you're going to come there in a tent. There is, you know, parent have to differentiate between, is this something that's temper outburst, is, or is my child in real danger, or my child actually needs my support, it has nothing to do with attention seeking. We have a number of questions about, um, <laughs> the uh, diagnosis, I think, the DMDD, yeah. and, and uh, there's questions about, does this also apply to kids who are more internalized instead of having temper tantrums? Uh, how do you, um, what about uh, childhood bipolar? How do you tell the difference between that okay. and the temper tantrums? So Right, so uh, no, in, in order for a child to be diagnosed with DMDD, you know, there's no, in, there's some internalizing, but you know, in, in terms of some of the feelings that they're having, kind of suppressing some of the things, but it's more of externalizing, you know, the behaviors that they have, because these behaviors come from them not being able to regulate themselves, so no, it's not internalizing kids. Now, in terms of difference between DMDD and bipolar disorder, so in the 90s there was this push to actually classified children that are now called DMDD as bipolar. However, people were able to recognize that this is a constant chronic thing, the, the eruptions. It's not something that's intermittent that would be actually uh, characteristic of a bipolar. And, and would you speak to applying what you're suggesting, the DBT for children, to children who maybe don't have the tantrums, but they're, they're internalized, they don't have, they have other mood problems. Uh, absolutely. This, you would apply this right, to that. Right, 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 absolutely. Well, there's research done right now with uh, t Tim in England. What's his name? Uh, I'm not sure. Who, uh, the, the, uh, uh, oh, gosh, just escape. From, from, from uh, um, the one who was, you know, who actually helped. Oh, Tom, 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 Lynch. Tim Lynch, thank you. Tim Lynch is doing internalizing, DBT with internalizing. Oh, true, with adults. Yes, with adults, with, with absolutely, with adults. right. Uh, okay, right. But, you, but it sounds like you would apply this to, to that. I haven't personally yeah. done it, right? This is something to, to look at. Uh, well, let me first see what Tim Lynch was able to do with yeah. internalizing, and then I'll figure out what to do with myself. And it also sounds like the kids that they were calling kind of childhood bipolar really are the, the kids, the, the DMDD kids. Well, some of them are bipolar, some of them DMDD. It all depends on is it chronic or is it intermittent. Why DMDD and not uh, borderline personality disorder? Why not? Apply well, that the only, um, um, well, how to say it? Usually we don't diagnose children as uh, uh, having a personality disorder where you can absolutely diagnose a child with personality disorder unless it's a um, antisocial personality disorder, which you cannot until they're 18. Um, however, is it really a personality disorder or a lot of it is a learned behavior? In my mind, a lot of this is a learned behavior. What's there is not a personality disorder per se. This is a disorder of emotion regulation that's built in. This is something that they're born with. Yes, they may be on the trajectory to develop borderline personality disorder, giving their symptoms. Um, however, I would not start there. Uh, perhaps on that same uh, vein, there's a question here speaking to um, the neuroscience that you referred to, and would it make more sense to call this a brain disorder? Is there a possibility that DMD would also become stigmatized, kind of labeling the child? What, what's, what's not a brain disorder? 
<clears throat> no, really. You know, one of the research that's going on right now that I'm really excited about, you know, it's not published yet, kind of like trickled through the grapevine. Um, um, uh, researchers at Harvard, Harvard, took several, you know, of, I think like 12 whatever volunteers, and they have them do mindfulness practices for 20 minutes a day for about, I don't know, 20 days, 12 days. And they took MRI before and after, and what they were able to find is mind boggling. Number one, they were able to find that there is a increase in the gray matter in areas that are tension, concentration, problem solving, memory, after 20 minutes of mindfulness for 12 days. And, but I could predict that, what I wasn't able to predict was that there is shrinking in the area that's fight and flight syndrome, uh, uh, fight and flight. So meaning that this, the, the fight and flight is shrinking, the other one's expanding, so you'll be able to regulate more and more effectively. So yeah, here we go. Uh, I think this is getting to um, some of the understanding and, and uh, issues of reinforcement. Uh, we have the tantrum is lying on the floor face down. What is that and what to do? Uh, we're thinking about a three-year-old. It's exactly the same thing. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Now, acceptance, validation, all of that stuff comes up either before temper outburst, when you're just catching the child maybe getting into that emotion mind and you catch him right before and say, Johnny, I totally get it. What just happened, oh my gosh, I got upset too. Okay, can we now breathe together? Let's just calm down. And then you cut it right then and there, or after the tantrum is over, child is in more or less normal mood, then you process, again, starting with validation. I totally understand what happened. You were feeling this because of that. Now, the outcome, did you like it? No, what can we do next time differently? And then you role play it. Don't just leave the child hanging there. Role play, role play, role play. Give actual points, rewards, whatever it is. Because you need to have behavioral rehearsal in it. But when child is on the floor, face down, tantruming, they're too far gone. There's no way you can actually do anything and he's going to hear you and understand and process it and actually do something different. Plus, you're going to give it attention. So it's not effective and actually can reinforce the tantrum. Thank you so much, Francesca.